All right, welcome in to a surprise and off-night edition of the Backwoods Bible Broadcast. And uh, your hillbilly here, Andrew Sluter, pastor of Bible Baptist Church. And Randy Keener's not with me tonight. We were in Texas all week long down at Brother Hickam's. But he's not with us tonight. we got another hillbilly with us tonight. That's right. Brother Dennis Snows. And he's from Tennessee, so he counts. <laughs> and, uh, are you, you know, you're from Alabama. I right. forgot. That really counts. Yes. Amen. So, yes. Amen. Well, it's good to be here. We had a good service here tonight, and uh, so it was a privilege to preach for Brother Knowles. And so if you're tuning in, my cell phone's messing up, and it won't let me share this thing on my page for whatever reason. So if you're watching, like and share this tonight. We're going to have a good time. Brother Knowles is going to talk with us about some ministry stuff, especially you preachers listening in. Like and share this. Get the word out there, and uh, we're going to have a good time with it tonight. Brother Knowles, it's good to have you on, my brother. Glad to be on. And uh, tell us a little bit about, we're here at Holy Hills Baptist yes. Church. We're in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Yes. Now, we're not at the edge of the world, but I think <laughs> I had to drive close to it to get here, from, yes. at least from Memphis yes. down on I-40. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the church here, brother. Well, I've been here about uh, three and a half years. I've been in the ministry, actually, as a pastor since I was 23. I just turned 50, so I've been pastoring a pretty good while. Uh, I was, had a good church down in Red Level, Alabama, where I'm from. And um, I pastored there for 12 and a half years. Felt like the Lord had finished my work there. And um, I just resigned, not knowing where I was going to go or what I was going to do. And so I resigned and, and uh, spent some time praying. And some people from this church got in contact with me and um, called me here. And it's been one of the greatest things that ever happened in my ministry. Um, we have a very good church here at Holy Hills. Obviously, we're all a church full of sinners, starting with the pastor on down. But uh, we have a very good church here, a good local church, uh, some good people. And, uh, that means that's we're good. That means good. we're good. All right. Good. So uh, that, I've been here now. So I've been in the ministry since I was 23, and I'm now 50. Been here about three and a half years, and uh, still in the honeymoon stage, man. Amen. Amen. Now, Brother Knowles, we was talking a little bit over some good fried catfish. Yes. Amen. Yes. That was sanctified by the Word of God in yes, prayer. Yes. Uh, we was talking a little bit. You came from a Southern Baptist background. Yes. Like myself, you came from a Southern Baptist sure background. Did. Sure did. That's, I'm licensed, ordained, married, um, educated, Southern Baptist College. And uh, if my wife does what I've asked her to do, she's going to bury me in a Southern Baptist graveyard. Right where I came from, right from the little church where I got saved amen. in South Alabama, a place called Andalusia, Alabama. Yeah, amen. Well, so you was raised Southern Baptist. Yeah. You, so you, you, you weren't saved growing up since you went to a Southern Baptist church. But, <laughs> no, <laughs> so some of the brethren think at least. So you was raised Southern Baptist, right. but now you're a Bible believer. Yes. Talk, tell us a little bit about how that happened. Well, I was preaching for, for years, most of my entire ministry, I was pastoring churches in the county where I'm from, down there in Andalusia, Alabama. And uh, I happened to meet a fellow. His name is Tom Johnston. Mm. And uh, he was a pastor in that area. And uh, he actually was, had graduated Pensacola Bible Institute. And I met him. Um, uh, one time we were going out and doing some ministry. And actually he was up on the street. He was preaching on the street. And somebody said, there's a fellow up there on the street telling everybody they're going to hell for playing pool. <laughs> Which he, he, he wasn't doing that. You know, right. that's just how yeah. they lie about street ministry. And me and my cousin said, well, let's go up there and talk to him about it. So I went up there and introduced myself to him and found out that that wasn't what he was doing. And uh, so he befriended us, was real gracious to us. I went to a four-year accredited Bible college. I earned a four-year bachelor's degree and got out and didn't know any Bible. And that man began to uh, show me some things and have Bible studies with me. I was very fortunate in that where I lived and pastored. I was only an hour and 15 minutes away from Pensacola, so I got to go to, the, to the, what we call the blowouts. And if some, some of out there listening don't know what they are, hear a lot of good preaching over the years and get, uh, get, learn how to rightly divide the Bible, learn all those kind of things. You got the street preaching, all the things that you do as a typical Bible believer. And I'm very, very thankful to God for it. Got, I, we always use the King James Bible, but uh, I didn't know what it why I believed it, why it was perfect, and God fixed all that through this man and, and then allowed me to meet so many other different Bible believers over the years. I'm truly grateful for it. I'm, I'm thankful for my Southern Baptist upbringing yeah. because I, it's given me some practical things that some of the Bible believers don't have, mm -hmm. and I'm glad to have that. 
And your, your ratings probably just went down when I said that. But yeah, well, okay. That's, that's okay. We, we, yeah. uh, you, you've not said anything worse than what we've said before. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so let me ask you this, though. So you're raised Southern Baptist. Yeah. You came over to Bible Believer. What's your first thought about you get around the Bible-believing crowd? I mean, what's your, yeah. there's this guy up on a street corner yelling. Yeah. What's your first thought about all that? I mean, well, what was your <clears throat> take well, on it? Well, you know, it didn't bother me as bad as it was some people because I was a little, I'm a little, you know, uh, outgoing and and uh, I like aggressive stuff. I've calmed a little bit down as I've gotten older, but I used to, you know, when I saw that, I thought, man, that's aggressive evangelism. Uh, I don't know why they're doing that. Southern Baptists don't do it, but uh, I was open to that. Um, most of the things didn't bother me. I was very thankful to learn that I didn't know anything about the Bible. Now I can actually learn it. After four years of Bible college, we had no types, no dispensational teaching. None of that stuff in a, in a Bible college. We didn't learn any, any Bible. Now, I learned a lot of good things in Bible college about the practical features of ministry, which is very important. Yeah. Um, but uh, as far as learning the Bible, of course, I had to go to the, to the bookstore and buy a New American Standard Version. That was our campus Bible. And all these things, when you've heard Dr. Ruttman and different preachers say that these professors say, you know, that's an unfortunate rendering. It would be better translated this way and all that. That stuff is 100% true because I was in a Bible college for years and I sat in there and I heard them do that. I heard them correct it. I heard them make fun of the King James Bible. That's a 100% true. Yeah. I was a part of that. So you... In the Southern Baptist world, you know, you made a statement, like, like you said, that may, that may have decreased our views, which, yeah. is okay, which is okay. Yeah. But there's some, you said there's some practical things about the ministry. Because typically what we do is we take, and if you've got a ministry question, we want you to submit it tonight. And we're not going to talk about the deeps and, you know, how many hairs are on the Antichrist left toe and all that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. tonight. And blood sucking, you know, angels from Jupiter. We're talking about that next week. <laughs> but... Uh, Amen. Uh, we're talking about practical ministry stuff, but you said a profound statement, brother, that a lot of a lot of guys would 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 balk at, but it's true because I saw I, when I was being raised, I was uh, seven hundred, almost a seven hundred member Southern Baptist Church. Yeah. Okay, and I've never preached in a well, maybe one I've preached over for uh, DeMichael in, in yeah. Treasure Valley, Idaho. They, yes. He's got a large Bible believing work over yes. there, and uh, but those are the exceptions, not the rule. And there's some different reasons with that, but right. but there's some practical stuff yes. that we can learn from the Southern Baptists. Absolutely, 100%. And you even did a message down at Peacock's, am yes. I right? I listened Dr. to it, Peacock's. it was good. Yes. yes. Give us a few things about the ministry that you gleaned that from the Southern Baptist viewpoint. Boy, we're really going to make the brethren mad yeah. tonight. It's okay. <laughs> I'm no. used to that. Yeah. Give us some things, practically speaking, from the Southern Baptists that you gleaned that is, because you've got a, I mean, I don't know how much you can tell on the camera, but you've got a beautiful building here yeah. and a good number of people, good for Wednesday night yeah. during a, you know, ep, you know global pandemic yeah. and stuff. Uh, even the crowd, that, I mean, there's at least four or 500 here just stayed for the question and answer, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, but, but a good crowd here. Yeah. Tell us some of the stuff that you gleaned from the Southern Baptist. Well, the Southern Baptists actually like people. <laughs> yeah. Not much. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've never heard a Southern Baptist preacher say that pastoring would be great except if it wasn't for the people. But I've heard of several, several Bible-believing preachers say that. Mm. And my, my, my comment to the, to the uh, Bible-believing preacher that would say that is get out of the ministry. Yeah. If you don't like people, you got no business taking their money. Yeah. you got no business uh, standing up on a stage and looking down to them and, and speaking in a condescending way that, like, that's done sometimes. Uh, Southern Baptists, uh, you don't keep up with what everybody else is doing. I mean, when, we, when I left the Southern Baptist Bible College, I left to go do something, mm -hmm. not to stay in everybody else's business and find out what the latest Bible believer over here is doing, and he's teaching heresy over here, and he's doing his thing over here. Uh, they don't do that. Southern Baptists know how to meet people and be friendly. It's not a compromise to be friendly to visitors. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a compromise to be inviting to, be, to visitors. I'm not talking about this secret friendly stuff. And this Rick Warren stuff. I'm just talking about acting like you got some common sense when people come into church for the first time. Right. And letting them know that you're friendly and you care about them. Uh, Southern Baptists are big on, um, on um, uh, taking care of things and doing business. Sometimes we as an as a, uh, independent Bible-believing work, we sort of fly by the seat of our pants. And uh, I, I don't agree with that. Now, I know Southern Baptists are business meeting you to death. But you need some business done every once in a while. And so they usually take care of that. Um, they are uh, 
Uh, many times, like I said, they, they see needs and ministry needs that need to be met. And whereas uh, an, an independent Baptist or a fundamental Baptist or a Bible-believing Baptist would just say, you know, the book, the book, the book, and nothing but the book. Well, of course, the book comes first. Preaching and teaching comes first. That is our main thing that we do in a church. But uh, we, we t t tend to get in a ditch. We either got to do this or do that. Why can't you do your first thing, which is preach and teach that book, mm -hmm. and then secondarily minister to people and try to meet needs with people and try to help folks? Um, Southern Baptists are notorious for going and helping people and giving them relief when tragedies hit and disasters hit, and they spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, and they mobilize people to go help them. Now, I know they need to be more about giving the gospel out, and I know it doesn't matter how you help a fellow if he dies in his sins and goes to hell, but why can't you do both? Why can't you implement both? Why can't you, why can't you go seek the lost? Why can't you door knock? Why can't you preach on the street? Why can't you preach and teach the book and help folks like that and, and be nice to people when they come? And, um, you know, the Southern Baptists... Uh, uh, as a whole, um, they know how to, uh, uh, like I said, uh, identify with people and be friendly to people and inviting to people and, um, you know, actually have some sense about ushers and meeting people when they come on, you come into the church and first impressions and all that stuff. I think that stuff is critical. I think it's important. Yeah. And you can say, well, if they really meant, really meant well, they'd come here and want to hear the truth. They wouldn't care about what who greets them or whatever. Yeah, man, but you're talking to somebody that's been in that book for 15 or 20 years. I'm talking to somebody that ain't saved. Or I'm talking to somebody that is saved. He's never been in a Bible-believing work. And the first person he sees is going to make an impression. Does he feel wanted? Does he feel like we want him here? Uh, does it, is it friendly? We have ushers at this church at every door. There's not a visitor or anybody comes in without being greeted, handed a bulletin, smiled at. And now when, once they get in here, the, the, sometimes they may wonder, why did I come today when the preaching gets started? Because it's fiery sometimes. Yeah. But they know that when they come here at Holy Hills Baptist Church, people are going to smile at them. They're going to shake their hand. Well, not so much now with COVID. But uh, they're going to be inviting to them, and they're going to feel they're going to feel welcomed at this church. Yeah. And if that's a compromise, you just chalk me up. Yeah. So you said something interesting that, you know, it's not a compromise to be nice to people because I yeah. think sometimes we feel like that if we're welcoming of people that, you know, it, or, or if we get too big, that's what I hear a lot. Well, you know, there just can't be a Bible-believing work that gets too big. Yeah. And I understand when you preach truth and all that yeah. that, there, that there is going to be a wane. We're not going to be as big as Joel Osteen, sure. you know. But, but, but a crowd doesn't mean compromise. Well, that's right. And, and talk a little bit about, about the fact that numbers, you know, we, and I know God's not necessarily concerned about the numbers, but the thing about numbers is, is each number does represent a person. Sure it does. Sure it does. And um, I think the thing that matters with numbers, after all, there is a book in the Bible called Numbers. How about that? Yeah. Um, but the thing about numbers is when numbers, when numbers get sinful and skewed is when you are worried about numbers based on your appearance. Well, we got a big church, and look how many buses we run, and look how many we posted on the board, and look how we're doing. Now, when you start focusing on numbers like that, you're really messed up. You've really, you really got messed up. But when you focus on numbers from a genuine heart concern like, okay, I don't care if I've got the smallest church in the county. It means nothing to me one way or the other, and I don't care if I've got the biggest church in the county. What that number means to me is there's somebody out there that needs some help. There's somebody out there that's hurting. There's somebody out there that may be lost. There's somebody out there about to blow their brains out. Or they've come, they've hit their head against the wall and they don't know what they're going to do. And we're going to try to go out there and reach them. That's why we have a visitation program every Saturday here. That's why we run three vans here trying to pick up kids and trying to reach people. Because we're not trying to build the thing up. I would, like, I would like for this place to be full. It may never be full. Uh, some of that is true about being a Bible-believing work because of who we are, what we preach, what we stand for. It ain't going to, uh, a lot of people in Laodicea ain't going to appreciate it. But there's a lot of people out there that need this. A lot of people out there that will come to it. And if we have people with a heart for ministry in this church that care about people and care about their soul. Do it not be like David where he said, no man care for my soul. Um, we, and uh, I believe that's uh, is that Psalm 142, I think it is, or, or Psalm 7. I can't remember which one it is. But, but this is a church that cares about people. And so what the numbers mean? Are we trying to compete? Are we trying to be, be big and trying to brag? Absolutely not. But what we want to make sure we do is the best we can to reach everybody we can. And, uh, and I don't think there's nothing wrong with looking at a number like that. Amen.
And just remind everybody that's watching, got some uh, people watching here. If you got a question about the ministry, something in the church, you got a church problem, deacon's wife giving you no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, something like that. If you want to, if you want to comment a question, well, I do have my cell phone. I'll be able to ask Brother Knowles um, any question you've got as far as ministry wise. Now, Brother Knowles, with that being said, what are what do you think are some pitfalls that Bible believing churches are getting into? And we want to be careful. You know, we don't want to sure. knock churches because everybody has their blind spots. Sure. I've got my blind spots in sure. the ministry in my church. Okay, but what do you think is a kind of a reoccurring theme amongst Bible believing churches? It's a pitfall and a, and a detriment to their growth, or even their spiritual well-being? What are you seeing a lot of? Well, first of all, before I answer that, I want to, everyone to understand I am a Bible-believing Baptist, and I don't want to be nothing else. I've been other things. I was a Southern Baptist for a long time. I appreciate what they gave me, but I am a Bible-believing, dispensational, rightly dividing, trying to be a soul winner, street preaching Baptist that, that uh, loves Dr. Ruttman, loves Brother Donovan, loves Dr. Peacock, I'm not ashamed of none of that. That's exactly who I am, and I'll tell everybody that, okay? So I want you to know that before I say what I'm going to say. But I think one of, the, one of the things is with Bible believers is because we know that we have the truth, and we know that we are the ones that rightly divine. Many times we get so focused on that doctrinal knowledge that we have that there's something wrong with our heart. Yeah. And um, I, I see that sometimes. You'll, you'll, you'll be around people and they're so big on knowledge, and they're so big on knowing that Bible, and you ought to be. But then there's something wrong in their heart. They don't have a ministry side to them. They don't have a practical side to them. A lot of Bible-believing preachers, not all of them, but, but, but some of them, they don't even understand the practical side of ministry. And, and uh, you know, uh, so many times the preaching and teaching, that's the number one thing we do as a pastor. Amen. I agree with that. But do you know how to bury somebody? Do you know how to counsel somebody that's in grief that's just lost a husband after 50 years or just lost a wife after 40 years? Do you know how to go talk with somebody that's thinking about killing themselves? Do you have enough sense not to go in there and just dump about 50 scriptures on them and say, well, brother, you just need to get over it and make sure you ain't got a devil or something like that? Listen, you got to use some sense with people. And, and sometimes with, with, with independent Baptists, it's just so cut and dry because we know so much but let's not forget what that book says to everybody else. It says to us who are Bible believers. And what it says is that knowledge puffeth up. And that includes all of us as Bible believers. And knowledge can puff you up. And sometimes some of the most arrogant people you'll ever meet are Bible believers. And it shouldn't be that way. We should be the most humble that, out of, that we are just as undeserving as anybody out there. And yet God would give us a chance like he gave me a chance. To give me knowledge, there's Southern Baptist preachers down there right now. They don't know a thimble full of Bible. But at the judgment seat of God, I believe they're going to do better than me and some of these other preachers because they've done the best they could with what they got. They didn't get the opportunity I got. They didn't get to meet some of the people I got. They didn't get people to teach them the things that taught me. They're just doing the best they can with the heart that they love the Lord Jesus Christ. And all these folks, some of these folks out here, you can rightly divide that book and you... You're faithful out on the street, and you should be. Praise God for you. But you can't even imagine there's going to be a fellow that reads out of an NIV in his church, and he's going to do better than you are at the judgment seat. Your ratings just went down some more. <laughs> That's okay. What, what are some things that you think that a Bible... So we got young men training for the ministry. I've got an institute online. we got young men. They're not pastors yet. PBI, TBDI, sure. all this stuff. And, 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 and they're getting the Bible. Sure. And they're getting some ministry stuff, too. Don't sure. get me wrong. You sure. Know, PBI and TBDI and, and, and ABI, or, you know, our institute, we give practical stuff as well. Admin, sure. Church, you know, we do a semester of church admin and stuff. But if, if we were to be honest, the area where sometimes Bible believers struggle with is a little bit on that practical church yes. admin side. What would you say, what would be some advice for a young preacher maybe that's just taken a church, about to start a church, that's going into the pastorate? Mm -hmm. What's some advice that you'd give them, brother? Well, they're going to have to exercise patience. And this is what you think. And this is where the young preacher can get messed up, and especially the Bible believer. You think that if you know that book real good, and you can rightly divide that book real good, you're, you're ready to pastor and that's not true.
Now, the most important thing you'll do in the ministry is to rightly divide that book and preach it and teach it. That's absolutely 100% true. But you think, are you all right? I'm going to be in the pulpit 30 minutes or an hour on Sunday morning, 30 minutes an hour on Sunday night, 30 minutes or an hour on Wednesday night. Do you know how many hours are left in the week for you as a pastor when you're fielding calls and you're meeting family and you're making administrative, administrative decisions and all kind of things that don't have nothing to do with preaching or teaching? So as a young preacher, uh, you need to get it in your mind that just because you know that book, just because... You can rightly divide that book. Doesn't mean you're qualified to pastor a goat farm. You're dealing with people. You're dealing with people that's hurting. Pastors put some unrealistic expectation on their people. If you're a pastor, and if you're lucky enough and for, blessed enough to be a full-time pastor like me, I, got, I get paid a good salary at this church to read my Bible, to pray, and to do all that stuff. These people are working 8 and 10 hours a week. They're coming home. They're trying to get youngins to bed and youngins fed and, and uh, get their baths and so they can get up and go to work the next day. And pastors, you think they ought to read their Bible as much as you or pray as much as you? Sometimes they're just doing the best that they can. You need to understand the practical side of ministry and, and learning how to hold somebody's hand, learning how to sit down and listen to somebody ramble for 30 minutes and ain't, that ain't saying nothing. But the, and you know, man, I got to go do this. I got to go study for this, whatever. But you sit there patiently and you say, and you're praying silently, God, help me listen to them. God, help me to be patient with them. God, give me something that would help these people. They're hurting right now. I know I got a million things to do, but I want to be there for them. I want to love these people. I don't want to just zone out. We think somehow that, you know, we just want to, I think so many young preachers just want to prove the kind of knowledge they got and how, what they know and just get them a pulpit and get them a, get them a platform. And so everybody just comes and here's what I got to say. But don't you fool with me after I get through preaching. Don't you want me to invest in your life. You just come here, sit here, be quiet, pay my, pay my salary and listen to me preach and teach and talk, tell you what to do and then let me go on my way. You might be a preacher doing that, but you're not no pastor. Talking about young preachers and, and all that, what are some of the dangers that you're seeing specifically with young guys going in? So we heard the advice. What's the dangers you're seeing? What's a, what's a dangerous trend you're seeing amongst young preachers uh, ministerial-wise, whether it be how they handle their church or how they handle themselves or, or anything? What are some of the pitfalls you're seeing? Well, when we were young and coming up as a young preacher, you, you, we, didn't have, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have media. Listen, when we were young, nobody got air. Billy Graham got national air time. And then you had, you had the, like the second rate there where you might have different satellite channels where you have a fellow like Adrian Rogers or somebody like that would get air time. And then you have the, the, the last level where you'd have different cable stations. You have somebody like Dr. Ruttman that'd get air time. Nobody else got air time. Nobody, there wasn't no computer where everybody was putting their stuff on it. And all, nobody got air time. You started out in a local church up under a pastor. And either he taught you there. You did like I did. I went off to Bible college to learn something. And you, you, you started there. First of all, you'd, you'd maybe go on visitation. Maybe you'd help clean the church. Maybe you'd dump the garbage cans. Maybe you'd scrub the toilets. Maybe, maybe you'd finally help substitute and teach a class. Maybe you'd lead the singing. What you did is you worked your way up and you found yourself faithful. And you learned to minister to people. And they found you faithful in small things. And then you got to preach every once in a while. And then as, as the pastor began to have confidence in you, he may call on you to preach more. And then, and then somebody else would hear about you and you'd get to go preach over there. And then, and then one day, you know, a church, they would open up an opportunity to go to a church that didn't have a pastor. And then they might call you to be a preacher, to be the pastor, rather, of that church. But nowadays with these young fellas, they don't have to work through nothing. There's no sweat and blood in it. There's no, there's no moving up and being patient. I see young preachers are very impatient, and I understand that. Uh, they should, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want a young preacher that wasn't impatient. That means he ain't wanting to do something. A young preacher should have that. They ought to have that zeal. But it's a zeal not according to knowledge many times. And they should have that. In, they should want to go. There's something wrong with you if you act like you're 75 when you're 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should want that, but they... But now what we have, you have to be aware of, is the Internet age where, where any Yahoo out there can put his stuff out there on the Internet. If, if I don't want to wait till I can get my church, I just get me an Internet church. And I can get my YouTube channel, and I can get my Facebook stuff, and I can get, promote all my stuff out there. It takes no blood, sweat, and tears. I don't even have to talk to nobody. 
I don't have to know nobody. I don't even have to care about you or love you one way or the other. I can just get my thing and get my likes and shares and, and get your attention. Now, me and you talked about this. I'm all for the ministry. We, we go live here every Sunday. We broadcast Facebook and we broadcast um, a sermon audio. I'm all about it, and I think you ought to use the tools that, that's available to us. I'm all about it. But you've got to be very careful when you go completely to that. And, uh, and that's what you're heading toward. And you never go through the pop proper stages of becoming um, a pastor that learns character and learns faithfulness uh, as a preacher. And that is a big danger in this, in this tech age that we got uh, uh, preachers that we were all impatient. All of us are impatient as young preachers. But we didn't have no choice, brother. We had to serve our way up. We had to, but these young preachers, they, they, got, they can go out and just get them a, get them a following just like that. And you got to be careful of that. That's where you get in all the, a lot of this nonsense that's on the internet. Hey Amen. This so I'm I'm we don't have any questions as of yet on online, but this is a question that I have personally. Sure. Um, I started Bible Baptist Church six years ago. We started in the living room. There uh, was a lot of people discouraging me from starting a work. Right. As a pastor, you took this work. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a Bible-believing work, as yes. far as I could, as far as I know, before you yes. took it. Yeah. So you know, but that's rare. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, a young guy coming out of Bible college that says, "You know what? God has called yeah. me to pastor, not just evangelize, not just sit on a pew. I know God wants me to pastor." Yeah. And of course, you know, God's will, you know, perfect will. It's different for everybody, but. Taking a church versus starting a church, what's right. your recommendation on that? Do, do you have a preference as far as what you think young guys ought to do, uh, preference-wise? Of course, you can't tell any, the will sure. of God for anybody. And why Why uh, the, your preference leans that way? Well, I don't know how much I can help you with this question because I have never felt impressed ever by the Lord to start a church. I've always taken over another man's work. Now, that is two different things. When you take over another man's work and you come into another church, you have to be very conscious of things. You can't come in there like a bull in a china shop and start changing things. These people have done it years a certain way, and the best thing you can do when you, when you accept a call to another church that's already been going, already had another pastor, you need to come in there, I believe, and just preach and teach and get to know the people. Uh, these folks can tell you I made no major decisions, hardly any at all here when I first come here. Uh, they didn't need me to come in here changing things and acting like I was going to come in here and tell them how it really ought to be done. This was a well-established, well-taught, well-preached to, um, Bible-believing church. They didn't need that. They just needed a leader. They needed somebody to love them, somebody to care about them, somebody that, that really meant that they wanted their well-being spiritually and to preach and teach that book to them, and that's what I, I tried to do. Um, so I, I believe that that's very important if you take a church not to go in there and try to change it because people are people. And you can say, well, they ought to listen to me. Okay, maybe you're right. Maybe they ought to. But these people have to do this slowly. They have to transition slowly. Now, so you're going to have a whole different set of problems if you go start a church. If you go start a church, uh, you don't inherit anything. In other words, once you start a church, the people that come in there pretty much know how it is. You've already laid the groundwork. You've already laid out what kind of ministry we're going to have here. There's no debriefing anything. And so, and so it's really good. You're going to have more control as a pastor. Uh, you're probably going to have, the, as the church grows, you're probably going to be able to set the temperature, and that's better. Here's the thing about it. Um, you need to know that you know that that's what God wants you to do because if you go out, make sure you're going out not because you think ain't nobody else doing it right but me. That's what I would warn a young preacher about. You better make sure that you're not wanting to go out and start a work rather than sit up under somebody else and him maybe one day turning the work over to you or you inheriting another work because, man, I don't want what somebody else has done and I ain't sitting up under nobody and ain't nobody around here can teach and preach like me and they really need some, uh-huh, uh-huh. That's why a lot of people go start a church and it's doomed to fail if you do that. You need to make sure if you are going to go start a church that it's not because you think you can do it better than everybody but you have a bur not just a burden but a calling, and maybe, and I would check out and see, are there other Bible-believing churches in that area? You might want to reconsider if there's already a Bible-believing work in the area or close to the area. I don't believe in starting churches right on top of one another. Um, you, you want to pray about going to an area where there isn't a Bible-believing work, and, um, and then possibly praying in there, and, and maybe, 
maybe uh, having some help from an older, mature pastor. Uh, maybe the, maybe whoever your pastor is at that time. Um, you know, I'm not. I don't believe in this dictatorship. I don't believe in well. You got to get this fellow's blessing before you go out and do something. Because a lot of older preachers, they want to get a death grip on the younger preachers and not let them go out. And they know we don't do this here. I want my younger preachers to be used. I want them to have the opportunities that I've been given to go out and minister to people. But you need to consult with them and, and get some wisdom from them and pray about it. And then let him help you and guide you in it. And uh, most of the people that start a, start a church like that, they go out and canvas the area. Find out if there's some interest. Find out if there's some people be willing to come. And try it out and see if it works. There's some people that started churches that's really done well. Your church has done well. It looks like that's exactly what you needed to do. And, it, and I'm not saying numbers signify whether you've done the right thing or not. I'm not saying that at all. But uh, uh, if you uh, just know this, I can tell you this. If you start a church and you take a church, you have to have two very different visions. If you take a church, you're taking something that's already built upon another man's work. Like it or lump it, and you cannot come in there and rush it and try to change it, even though you're going to come in and see obvious things that need to be changed. You have to be patient with your people, and you have to do it as the Lord leads it. If you start a work, you're going to have the, you're going to have the, the problems like you had. If you're going to have to work and trying to, trying to have money and trying to feed your family and trying to get the thing off the ground, and you're, you're probably going to have to you know, get some leaflets and flyers and advertisement out, let them know you have it. But that will be very rewarding because whatever you build will come there up under you and they'll know what they got. As just like when a new pastor comes to a church, he's usually going to have some people to leave because they're just not going to like the new pastor for whatever reason. You can't take it personal. It just happens. But if you go start a church and they come up under you, they know what it's going to be. Yeah. Let's talk about something you mentioned in that because a lot of times – young men, in my opinion, which is, you know, my opinion, everybody's got one, but sometimes I see young men wanting to take a church yes. for the fact that they think, well, I, if I take one, I don't have to work a job and there's perks. And that's, I mean, there, there are situations where that is true versus if you start a church nine times out of 10, you're going to be working a job and yes. all that. And even sometimes guys who take churches got to work a job. Yes. How do you talk? Let's talk about maybe the balance. Cause I had to work or sure. 50 hours a week for sure. the first you know, two years as a plumber, and then I got an insurance job that helped me you know, yeah. free up some time. But talk, let's talk about some of the personal, personal aspects of a preacher's life and maybe some like time management. When's the right time to quit a job and work yeah. in a job? And, and talk Because I see a lot of guys get really unbalanced. Yes. They either want to yeah. sit on their duff and take a full-time position yeah. or not do anything, and then you got other guys who want to try to make a, make a you know, killing yeah. off their job while they're pastoring, and pastoring is just a thing to do, and they're sure. working a job. Talk about some of the balance of, of when to have a job, when not to have a job, being careful about chasing after a dollar while pastoring, yeah. blah, blah, blah. I think the number one thing is just to be surrendered. In my ministry... It went back and forth. I took my first church in the early 90s. They paid me $20 a week. And when I left, I was making $75 a week. Not back in the 50s now. My first church. So obviously I was working <laughs> as much as I could. All right, I stayed there almost three years. And I went to another church. The next church was full time. They had a parsonage for me. A little parsonage. And paid me a decent salary. Okay. But it was enough to go full time. Well, I... I have never resigned with a church to go to, never. I've never, I've, I've had pulpit committees come and listen to me, but every time I've ever resigned a church, I didn't have anywhere to go. I just felt like I wasn't going to wait until I had financial security. That's just me. I felt like I needed to trust God with that. So I, I left that church. I resigned. I felt like I'd done all I could do there. I was there for about five and a half years, and I took another church. I went from a full-time church and took a church with eight people. And that was a church before here. And so we was, they, I remember they came in there and said, we're going to pay you $100 a week. I said, I don't think you are. We ain't going to have $100 a week to pay me, to pay the light bill. So I worked two jobs at that church when I began, two jobs and pastoring. And that church really began to grow. I mean, people just started getting saved. We built fellowship hall. We built a sanctuary. We built Sunday school space. We had to clear off parking. It grew. I got full-time. I was full-time, and I had an assistant pastor that was both full-time before I left. The Lord really done a great work there. But through it all, I was surrendered. 
all right, I, I, I resigned again. I was there 12 and a half years, felt like the Lord was finished with me, and he's brought me to this church. This church is full-time. They pay me a very good salary, very good salary, take very good care of me. But what you've seen in my life is I was willing to go down and up and then back down again and up, if you want to call it that financially. Yeah. I think the main thing is just to be surrendered. Don't take a church for money and don't not take a church about money or anything like that. But just do what you have to do. Now, if you're, now listen, if you're, if you're bivocational, and some people are all their life, that is very difficult. And you can only do so much. And your people are going to have to understand you can only do so much. And that church isn't worth you losing your family over. Okay? You're gonna, you, they're going to have to understand if they don't have the money to pay you full time, it's not their fault. You shouldn't get bitter with them and they shouldn't get upset with you. But there are some things that a fella cannot do if he's working another full-time job in pastoring. And they need to be understanding of it. And the pastor needs to be understanding of it. Because also what you'll get to doing is, is you'll get to thinking, i got to make a living, i got to make a living. And you can go so far that way where you work yourself to death. I've done that before. I've been to church before. Uh, just get home, get a shower, try to get changed and try to go preach. And you're just almost too tired to do it. It's tough sometimes. You, I know you understand that. It's just a tough deal to be in, and there's really no easy way to do it. And a lot of churches have to have a pastor like that because they're small churches, especially small Bible-believing churches. And if we didn't have bivocational preachers, uh, well, they could not make it. I think those are some of the greatest preachers in the world that have to work a full-time job and sweat and, and go through all that, and yet they, they try to love their people and pastor their people and, and, and be there for those people. Those are some great preachers that have my... Respect and admiration. I think as soon as you can, as soon as you can, you need to go full time if you can. And you need to be willing to do it on the least amount. Now, this is you've asked me, so I'm just going to give you my opinion. Yeah, you ought to do it. You ought to do it on the least amount of money as possible. You say, well, if they ever get me up here, then I'll go full time. I've never done that. I don't believe you ought to do that. You ought to say, look, this is where I can make it and I can survive, and I'll just trust God with the rest, and I'm going full time because you're always going to be able to give more to your people and give more to the ministry when you go full-time. A lot of people, I've known some pastors, that didn't want to go full-time because they knew if they went full-time, what their church was going to pay them was nothing like what they were making working. And that's a temptation right there. And when, when, when you could actually downsize some things and go full-time, and you make the decision not to because based on money, mm. um, you have to be careful about that too. Those are pitfalls you want to watch. But I think the main thing is just be surrendered. If he Listen, I hope I finish my race here. I really do. I love where I'm at right now. I hope my people keep loving me. I hope I, hope I can finish my race here. I hope I can, I can go out to the end of my life or until Christ comes back. But I truly believe if the Lord's told me tonight, he said, I'm finished with you here, and I want you to go back to Alabama or Georgia or wherever, and there's a church down there with ten people, and I want you to take that church with 10 people and get you a job. I'm going to load up and go. you just got to be surrendered to God to do whatever he tells you to do. Amen. Well, Brother Knowles, we got some submitted questions. Sure. John Dillinger, I don't yeah. know if you know him I know, or not. I know Brother John, yeah. Well, I said that because I know you know him yeah. and because of the question he asked. Sure. He said he wants to know your position on mustaches versus beards. Um. Considering we are at odds here yeah, yeah. with that. I feel like that was a direct attack and yeah. trying to put a wedge between us and no, our... No, bro. <laughs> Brother John, I, it really don't matter um, um, to me because <laughs> I have a round, fat face. A beard don't look good on me. But it does seem to cover my little bird lips, so I use a mustache. For Andrew, he's sporting that pretty good. Well, it I mean. covers my double chin quite well. yeah. 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 I think it has to do with your face. <laughs> Brother Tyler fell out here in my church right now. He's got a good beard. He looks good in beard. But, but uh, just, just whatever, whatever helps you look the best, Brother John, that's what I tell you. Amen. And then Brother Brantley, he wouldn't look good with either one. No, I mean, no, 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 <laughs> no. All right. Uh, hey, Michael Lloyd, he's got a question, kind sure. of a multi-part question. Yeah. Um, here, we'll, we'll uh, and I know we're getting close to quitting. We're about sure. five minutes, so maybe we'll close with this. Uh, well, we'll ask this, and then you close up with any concluding thoughts you may have, brother. He said, how do you build up new church members in the Bible? What are some basics you feel are vital to make sure that a new believer or a new church member 
uh, should know? What are some doctrines that, that you would teach? Well, I'm not trying to st- sidestep this like a politician, but you have to be careful. Make sure you don't already have a preconceived agenda. Sometimes we want our people to go faster than what they're capable of doing. I used to be bad about that, Brother Andrew, in the ministry. I, t- I take a church and say, okay, in six months we're going to do this, and in a year we're going to do this, and we're going to pick up these many people, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. And I found out that none of it ever happened like that. So when people come in, people grow at different levels. A lot of people don't attend church faithfully now. You don't get as many shots at them as you used to. So there's, <laughs> you just people are just different. But there are some basic things. I mean, first of all, you want to nail down eternal security. What salvation is, eternal security. Uh, baptism that takes place after salvation, not far since salvation. Make sure they understand that. I would preach, you know, have you a strong prayer life. Tell them to read the Bible. You know, that, 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 that the Bible is a spiritual book and they're not going to grow if they don't read the Bible. Just obvious things like that. Encourage them how to pray. Um, encourage them to come to church. You, you might want to talk to them about giving. I don't, I don't promote the tithe. I'm, there again, we'll just leave with something where people can argue about. I don't promote the tithe, but I certainly will promote that if you, as you grow in the Lord, you ought to give something to the Lord. That is the official stance of the Backwoods Bible Broadcast. Yeah. About yeah. not promoting the tithe. So yeah. you're Amen. In, good. You're in safe good. waters with that good. on here. Good, good, <laughs> good. You know, um, just be faithful. The main thing that I would tell them, you know all these things probably, that about reading your Bible and praying and getting in church and and all the main thing I would tell them is look, you cannot grow in the Lord if you do not make yourself available. I can take some time with you as a pastor. There's mature Christians in this church that can take some time with you to help you grow. Women with women and men with men. But if you don't come, if you don't put your flesh down enough to be in church, to get the instruction, to get the encouragement, to get the prayers, you're just not going to grow. And that's the problem I see with many people after they get saved or Maybe they don't ever, ever really get in church or they get in church for a while then they drop out and they don't avail themselves to the things. So you, can't, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make them drink. Now there, like I said, there's some basic things you want to implement to try to point them in that way. And I'll just say this one more thing. Try to stress to everybody that's just saved, everybody that's new and growing, that the most important thing in your life is your fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Stress to them that they need to be meeting with God. They need to have a, um, a, 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 not just a relationship through the new birth, but a fellowship with God. They need to learn how to have communion with Him. They need to learn how to talk with Him. He walks with me and talks with me, and He tells me I am His own. They need to learn to have a, an abiding presence. And, Pastor, if you don't have it, you can't teach them. So you need to walk with God. You need to try to have some fellowship with Him. You need to be able to be, get up there and tell your people sometime. Man, I was out on my deck this morning drinking coffee, praying, and the Lord showed up. And he got all around me. I mean, I felt like he was hugging me. And we just had a good time of fellowship. They're going to need that, especially in these dark days that we got facing us here in America. So they have to avail themselves to it. And I would teach them that nothing is more important than keeping your personal fellowship right with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the basic things they'll need to grow in the Lord. Brother Knowles, I appreciate you coming on tonight. Yes. It's been good. It's been practical. This is stuff that Bible believers need. Yes. We, we need it. And so uh, I don't have any more questions. There's no more questions on here. And we've got just maybe two or three minutes here before it wraps up. What are, what are some closing, closing remarks that you have about it all? Well, I've been pretty emphatic about stuff here tonight. And I don't want to leave as confident. Uh, even since I've got up here, I've had to try to figure out some things. There's been times in my life that I didn't know where I was coming or going. And the last thing I would want <clears throat> anybody to listen to me and think that I think I know it all, because I certainly don't, and think that I'm flawless or think that I don't have problems. I'm still working on my character too, folks. I'm still trying to grow in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I think the one thing I'd leave with everybody, whether you're a preacher or not, if you'll just come to the Lord and tell them how fallible you really are, tell them how much you really don't know, tell them how helpless you really are, because he already knows it. He just wants you to know it. And you just humble yourself before the Lord. It's an amazing thing what God can do with an old country boy from Alabama. Amen. And he's no respecter of persons, and he can do it with you. Amen.
Amen, brother. Thank you for coming on. It was a joy to be in your church tonight. Always enjoy meeting new Bible believers and all that. Thank you for watching. Hey, everybody, like and share this video. This is good stuff. We also want to remind you, if you've not liked and subscribed, you can go to my YouTube channel, like and subscribe, Andrew Sluter. Come and like Holy Hills Baptist Church page. Great preaching and singing. One of my most favorite singers and piano players is the Mark Brantley, Amen. the guy that does... Uh, the the piano playing here. If I had a million dollars a year to give him to play for me, I would do that. <laughs> I still don't know if he'd come, but anyway, uh, like like the page here, Holy Hills Baptist Church. Also, February twelfth. Don't forget the twenty four hour broadcast. We're yeah. raising money for our church plant in India. We got to finish paying off that building. Beautiful <laughs> building over there, and so we're raising about nine or excuse me ten thousand dollars for that. February twelfth. We're having the twenty four hour broadcast. If you're a pastor. Pray about what uh, what you might want to give through your church. Or if you're an individual, pray about what you might have to give. We'd love to get that $10,000 mark, and that would completely pay off the building. So remember that. We'll go from 10 to 10. We're going to be eating hot peppers, <laughs> eating nasty stuff. We'll be interviewing some different people. We'll have Brother Gip on. We'll have Humberto Gomez on. Brother, uh, I think we may get Brother Grady. I'm not sure yet. I forgot to ask him last week in Texas. But we're going to have a lot of interesting stuff. Brother Tillis will be on with some paranormal UFOs. <laughs> UFOs flying around, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Who knows? We may get Biden on. We're not sure yet. So <laughs> don't miss it. Watch the 24-hour broadcast. Yeah. We will be going from 10 o'clock to 10 o'clock, and uh, we're going to need a lot of energy drinks. All right. <laughs> but again, brother, thank you for yes. coming on. It was a thank joy. You thank you for watching. Until next time, same Backwoods channel, same Backwoods time. God bless you is my prayer.